really, really intentionally teach my acquisition managers about new construction, going back to how and, and, and when I learned, I learned by actually building single family houses with, with, with my older friend and, and, and mentor. And, and so many of the people that have moved into land and direct to seller marketing, they don't know anything about new construction. They don't know what a plat map is or what setbacks are or yeah, plot plan, perk test, all these different uh, terms that are all essential to being able to put new construction on a lot. And so that helps a lot because many of these sellers are retired developers that just have a couple lots left. And so actually being able to competently speak on the asset class we're targeting is really essential. If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. Welcome to another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, and this is the show where we talk about how to raise money for your real estate deals without ever asking for money. Well, my guest today has raised over $2 million in private money. And in fact, he's actively raising more private money right now. Well, here's what's interesting. He's actually started his real estate investing journey all the way back to when he was only 16 years old. Can you believe? Now, in addition to that, he's been buying rentals consistently since he was in college and he's built out quite an impressive land and development business, the acquisition of the rentals. Now he left his traditional full-time employment job as in the W2 job when he was only 23 years old. And now he's got the freedom to work on what he wants to work on without being tied down to, you know, the day job. Well, he's currently working on a mixture of new development, land investing, and he's still building his long-term buy and holds. In just a moment, you're going to meet my friend and very special guest, Dan Haberkost, right after this. Well, welcome to the show, Dan. Great to have you back on from a couple of years ago. How are you doing? Jay, I'm great. Thanks for having me. Excited to catch up. Absolutely. Well, I'm excited to have you back. And, you know, as I said here in the intro, I mean, you started real estate all the way back in when you were 16, you quit the day job when you were only 23 years old. Um, I don't know. You look 24 now, but <laughs> <laughs> I shaved this morning. So <laughs> you shaved this morning. there you yeah. go. Uh, but take us all the way back. So, you, you know, you're raising private money. You've raised over a couple of million in private money. You got all kinds of deals going on. And in fact, you're actively involved in um, some uh, pursuits right now that tie right in to raising private money. We want to get into that and talk about exactly how you've been raising money, what's your favorite ways to raise private money? How do you start conversations with people? Where do you find these people to, you know, be private lenders? But before we dive into that, <clears throat> take us all the way back to 16. How did you get started in real estate when you were only 16 years old? Sure. So I'm from Ohio originally. I live in Colorado now. Uh, but when I was 16, I was managing a farm and my boss would go to Aruba for a good portion of the year and leave me to manage his farm and also his rental properties. And so if something was wrong, tenants would call me. I remember being in high school, having to leave early to go deal with uh, a tenant problem in the middle of winter. Uh, when I was 16 or 17 years old. And so, so that was my first experience with real estate. And it taught me all about the real estate. I do not want to own anyone from Ohio can tell you that most of the buildings there, whether it's single family, multi, anything is generally much older. Uh, I was in a suburb of, of Cleveland, a very rural suburb of Cleveland and a lot of century homes, which just constant problems, not a great tenant demographic. Uh, and so that was a useful experience, but definitely not uh, uh, exciting uh, for a 16, 17, 18 year old. Fast forward through college, worked full time, went to school full time. And when I was about 20 years old, I, I, I kind of was doing some planning, right? Reflecting. I was getting close to finishing school and I thought, well, what am I going to do when I get out? If I can handle 45, 50 hours work 
per week plus full-time school. I can certainly start some sort of business or do something to accelerate myself financially uh, once done with school. And started reading about equities, different types of investing, business, et cetera. And like pretty much everybody else, it was when I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, it was like light bulb moment. And uh, so read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I don't know, I was 2021 20, and ended up buying a duplex, a house hack in Parma, Ohio when I was 21. And so that was my first ever personal acquisition. Soon thereafter, decided I didn't want to stay in Ohio, moved to Colorado Springs, bought another house hack. Great. Uh, I had a two property portfolio. Well, it was around that time I, I still had a job and I realized hmm, the low and no money down stuff as far as actual investing, actual buy and hold rentals, <clears throat> it doesn't work so well as far as scaling a, a large portfolio. You need money. I bought rentals on zero or 100% owner financing and you still need money because things are going to go wrong. So I thought, all right, I hate having a job anyways. So how do I find some sort of active business I can start to then complement or, or feed the investing? And long story there, but I met a guy at the local real estate group here in Colorado, which I actually host now, who had been doing land and development for the last 40, 50 years. I drive an hour south every weekend to Pueblo West, Colorado, for anyone who knows where that is. And I'd, I'd help him in his business, help him. He was building houses at the time, simple infill spec homes or pre-sales oftentimes. And so it started by helping him here and there with the land acquisitions and going off market and getting lots to build on and participating in the builds. And <clears throat> ultimately that's where Front Range Land came from. So fast forward to today and quite simply, Front Range Land is a giant direct to seller marketing funnel centered around buying land cheaply from 30 to 70 cents on the dollar, depending on what I intend to do with it. Uh, and, and the specifics of the lot, a few lots at a time, I'll, I'll put new construction on. And a lot of them are just simple wholesale to retail. And to be clear, uh, rarely do assignments. I close on them, but I mean, buy low, sell high. That's, that's the dispo strategy for most of them. Uh, working on some small subdivides, that sort of thing. But it's, all about buying a good deal and it's always within the context of land and so that that's my active business and that is what has fed the purchase of more and more rental properties uh and actually right now i'm building a couple duplexes that i'm just going to keep as rentals so uh that's the quick synopsis of how i got where i am today sure well i want to talk with you about your experience in raising private money and then i want to um come back around and, and talk about this land um, asset that you're interested mm -hmm. in and why that excites you and et cetera. Let's start with the private money. Um, what was it? Uh, I mean, I've discovered over the years that most real estate investors have something that happens mm -hmm. in their business that then triggers them or forces them to learn about private money. How did you get first introduced to this world of private money and and how did you start raising private money? What happened? Yeah, the first time I ever raised private money was with the older friend and, and mentor I told you about where I went out, I did a bunch of direct to seller marketing, got a bunch of land deals, far more than I could afford to to close on. And so that was the impetus to go figure that out. And he started funding deals for me and we split them 50 50, which Oh man, I can't imagine those annualized returns he was getting in hindsight. So I definitely joke with him about that uh, today. But so that that was the original impetus. And, and from there, it's grown via referrals. You know, like I said, I host the real estate group in town. Just talking about what I do, I really haven't ever asked anyone directly, or let me say this again, I haven't initiated the conversation. It's more they approached me because a friend of a friend or they heard me at the real estate group or they heard me on a podcast or followed me online and they started asking questions about how they might be able to participate. Uh, and so that uh, is, is where it started. But let me, let me pause there before I go on any further. No, that's fine. Well, one thing you had to do to get people interested in you is people needed to hear your story mm -hmm. so they would even be you know involved in it. So <clears throat> the real estate investing group that you were referring to, did you happen to start that or run it or were you a member or what was your association with the group? I started going to it when I moved here in 2018. And then I got to know the hosts who had started it before I even lived here. 
and one was moving uh, and he had become a friend. And so I took his place uh, a little over three years ago, hosting the group. So I host it now. Okay. Well, there's a lot to be said for either starting your own group or hosting a group mm -hmm. or being the go-to person, because that right there elevates you with credibility, trust, authority for being the person that runs the group. And that right there is going to attract other people that want to do business with you. Right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And I, I just want to pause and say it's, especially for new people, it's always hard to make the investments into something like hosting a real estate group, whether it's time or money, hosting a real estate group or all the things that might not pay off right away, might not make you any money tomorrow, but down the road, you're going to be really glad you did them. Uh, and, and that's a good example of that in that, you know, when I started hosting that three years ago, or when I started going to it six years ago, there was a, a big time investment up front, but now, you know, years down the road that really pays off in a variety of ways. Uh, and so try, you know, this is more speaking to the new people in the room, because when you're new, you, you want to make money, you're thinking 60, 90, 120 days ahead. And oftentimes you shoot yourself in the foot, you know, a year from now, two years from now, by only focusing on the short term. And so when you're new, and I think about this today, I think about 10 years from now, 15, 20 years from now, and I make sure that I am planting seeds, right, that will produce down the road and may, maybe won't do anything for me right now, but will really pay off down the road. And so hosting that real estate group and what that's done just as far as reputation uh, has been invaluable, but it certainly didn't pay off for quite a while. Right. Yeah, that is that is a long term play. Um, does a mistake come to mind or or um, uh, something that you would have done different uh, since you started uh, working with private money lenders? What advice would you give to other investors um, when it comes to working with private lenders? What would you do different now or what do you do different now in working with private lenders that you may have changed since you started? Well, the biggest thing that I do differently is I just I offer more reasonable returns. Again, those giving 50% of the deal uh, on, on many of these deals to uh, the lender who is totally passive. And we're talking two to four month land flips where they're almost doubling their money. I mean, they're just obscene returns. So, of course, I wouldn't pay multiple 100% annualized interest. Uh, that's one thing. Um, another point, which I'm happy to say I have not made this mistake, but I'll just say it to everyone because this is essential. Reputation matters more than anything. And I don't care if you're losing money. I don't care what the scenario is, no matter what, always make your lenders whole. Um, so I just want to make that point. And that's that's essential. Uh, under no circumstances, your lenders ever lose money, you know, barring you going bankrupt, I guess. Um, and then let's see, don't be shy. Don't be shy about it. I, I definitely limited myself where uh, I could have done more sooner if I wasn't, if I didn't have a fear around uh, uh, raising money. And kind of as a corollary to that, there's always the chicken or the egg sort of uh, debate, you know, where um, people don't want to go get a deal because they don't have money. But then, oh, I don't want to start talking to people because I don't have a deal. Uh, it's easier to raise the money once you have a good deal under contract or you're close, right? So I would be of the, the mindset of, working to find the deal first. Well, work on them in conjunction, but don't be afraid of going out and pursuing a deal and getting something under contract. Again, assuming it's a good deal because you haven't yet figured out the money because that is very solvable if you have a good deal under contract, especially right now. There is so much cash sitting in people's bank accounts. It's crazy. Yeah, I've had more private money chasing me since yeah. this side of COVID than actually before COVID. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, one thing I say all the time is desperation has got a smell to it. Yeah. And so Dan and you, you and I will perhaps differ on this point, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. We all do business a little bit differently. Um, I practice and preach, uh, getting the money lined up first. I tell you one thing that mm -hmm. drives me crazy. And I know you've heard this. I know you've mm -hmm. heard this, but I've heard it and it drives me nuts, particularly when it comes to educators, they'll say, Oh, just go get the deal under contract. The money is show up. And I want to say where, well, I mean, if somebody has got no idea where the money's going to show up and they've got a deal under contract, it's like, I don't want to deal with that stress. And so for me, in my experience, 
it's always been easier to get the money pledged as long as I've got a plan on how I'm going to find my deals. I don't want to go have money pledged and I have no idea as to how I'm going to, you know, get deals uh, lined up. But one thing that I heard you say a few minutes ago really resonated with me. And that is I've never asked, or you said that you've never like asked directly for money. You know what? I've raised eight and a half million dollars. I've never asked anybody for money. And people say, Jay, how in the world do you do that? Mm -hmm. Well, I simply put on my teacher hat. And I know you've got this spirit, Dan. Mm -hmm. I started teaching people that I've got some kind of relationship with. I put on my private money teacher hat and teach people what private money is, what self-directed IRAs are, how they can make high rates of return safely and securely. And I lead with a servant's heart, educating people. So I have my program, particularly for single family houses. Here's how much I pay. Here's the length of the notes. Here's how you can get your money back in case of an emergency. And then once they tell me that, oh, well, I'm, I'm really interested in that and how much they got to work with, then I give them a call, which is called the good news phone call. Mm -hmm. And the good news phone call is I call them up and let's say, Dan, let's say you're one of my private lenders. I'll call you up and I say, I got great news. I can now put your money to work. I got a house under contract in Newport. Uh, the funding requires $150,000. I know you got $150,000. You already told me. And the closing's next Wednesday. You got to have your funds wired to my real estate attorney's trust account by next Tuesday. I'm going to have my attorney uh, email you the wiring instructions. End of conversation. The most stupid question I could ask is, do you want to fund the deal? Well, of course you want to fund the deal because I'm not bringing a deal for my private lender to fund, unless it's a deal that matches up to the criteria of the program, you know, that I already taught them. But um, anyway, you're well on your way to raising a lot of private money. You got all different kinds of asset classes going on. What is, I mean, you got different asset classes. You got buy and hold, uh, you've got land that you're into, um, you've got development. What's your favorite asset class and why? Well, I want to really make the distinction clear of front range land is just a means of making money. It isn't, you know, I, I probably say this accidentally where, oh, it's land investing. It, it's not investing. It's just a simple arbitrage business to make money so that I can go invest. I bought a fourplex last Monday. That is investing. And so it, it really depends, Jay. I mean, for the buy and hold, I like nice residential properties. Granted, there's plenty of types of assets I've never bought. So perhaps that'll change in the long run. But, you know, I, I look at some of the houses or, or small, so small duplexes I own and hear from the tenants maybe once a year. They keep it immaculate. You know, they take care of it like it's, it's like it's their own house. So often what people tout as the advantages of multifamily are also negatives. And uh, it's more <laughs> around selling something than it is reality, right? There's a pros and cons to everything. I look at some of these houses and, and it's just, it is actually passive. And so going forward, you know, I mentioned I, I'm having a couple duplexes built just to keep asset class. Sure, they're, they're ground up, but they're, I mean, these are infill lots and, and building a house or a duplex is so simple. It's a box with some infrastructure. Um, and so I like buildings that are younger than me that are in B plus or better areas where I can have tenants that at least have a 700 credit score. Cause my experience has been that I have no problems with that demographic. So for buy and hold, that's more of what I'm, I'm, I'm interested in. And especially going forward, when I think about where I want to put my time, it's gotta be either new or very new and very, very nice, or I don't want to touch it. You know, I'm from Cleveland, don't want to touch anything back there in the Cleveland Metro. Uh, old buildings, poor tenants, terrible weather, that sort of thing, not interested. You can make a lot of money doing that. That's just not what I want to do. Now, switching to the active side to how I make money every day, I love land because it's it's incredibly inefficient. inefficient. And so I'll never forget going back to the beginning of the show when I told you when I was you know 20 -ish years old, started reading about different assets, different means of investing. And I read about the efficient market hypothesis and and how that pertains to equities. And that's really where it came from. But I think about that concept as it applies to real estate and something like multifamily or, or housing, 
uh, single family housing would be far more efficient where it's really hard to go buy a discounted large apartment or, or single family house. And you can do it. You do it all the time. But there's a whole system and process behind. There's a whole business direct to seller marketing. It's it's not easy. And then within the world of real estate, land is the very, very you're one of the very, very inefficient asset classes, not well understood. People don't know how to price it. Uh, just again, not well understood is the best way to say it. And so it's inefficient and much easier to buy at a discount. And so again, for for day to day making of money to go buy nice, buy and hold assets, I like land. So you said something a moment ago that I want to unpack or get mm -hmm. you to unpack. So first of all, front range land, you've said that a couple of times, that's your company. Mm -hmm. You're the CEO of front range land. So we want to talk about what your company does. And you said also right after that, you said that it's an arbitrage play that allows you to make money. Mm -hmm. So unpack all that. What in the world does that mean? What does front range land do? And what do you mean by arbitrage and how do people make money um, in what you're talking about? Sure. Sure. You know, it's funny. I'm trying not to go off on a tangent here, but I like to tell anecdotes really to drive points home. And so I, I finished a book recently called The World for Sale. I forget what the subtitle was, but it was all about uh, uh, commodity traders, the history of them and then how they've grown and, and, and talking or the history of some of the biggest commodity trading businesses in the world. And some of these companies are worth five, six, seven hundred billion dollars, probably a trillion today, because this was written like seven or eight years ago. Uh, and all these companies do are simple arbitrage where they can buy at X and sell at 2X, 3X, 4X, but they do it on a worldwide scale. That's all or almost all I'm doing with Front Range Land. Direct to seller via mailer, cold calling, uh, email to buy land at a discount off market. Much of it we just resell on the market. That's it. Really, really simple. And then, uh, you know, I'm working on some deals just east of where I live out in eastern El Paso County. That's Colorado, not Texas. And uh, doing some small working on some small subdivides out there. You know, so sometimes it's it's modest improvement to the land to then resell it at a higher price. But the vast majority of the time, it's simple wholesale to retail, buy it at X and sell it at two X. Uh, and so it's all about just identifying the avatar that sells at a discount. I'm sure you do the same thing with single family homes and then marketing to and, and, and ultimately sifting for that avatar and then buying and selling. So you mentioned direct to sellers. So you're talking about direct marketing, mm -hmm. which I suppose you do direct mail as part of your marketing, direct mail to the owners yep. of, of the land. Are you direct mailing to people that just own lots or you might direct mailing people to, that have acreage that could be a farm or all the above? Mostly simple infill lots, but working on some very specific uh, areas with acreage to do some small, simple subdivides. Because depending on the county, depending on the, the, the zoning codes, subdivides can be very, very simple. East of me in eastern El Paso County, so east of Colorado Springs, uh, if you keep them 35 or larger, you can take these several hundred acre tracks, split them up into 35s for a few thousand dollars to have an architect or engineer just redraw the plat, get a new survey and record it yourself and you're done. Uh, and so so subdividing can be a massive process that takes years and years, depending on the, the size and complexity. And then sometimes it's very simple, uh, you know, in whatever county you're looking, talk to the planning department about minor versus major subdivisions and what goes into that. Gotcha. So you're doing your direct marketing to the owners. And then that I hear you say, after you acquire it or purchase it, you then just list it with a realtor in the multiple listing service and just flip it. Most of the time. Yep. Well, that's pretty simple, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yep. And I'm sure some people would say, well, why didn't the owner of that lot just list it themselves and put it in the multiple listing service? Uh, I want to hear your answer, but my answer is I never try to second guess why people do what they do. <laughs> so I'm actually glad you said that. I need to make a point there. Stop assuming that your perspective is that of everyone everywhere in the world. Like everyone does this. Well, well I wouldn't sell the discount. Well, who cares what you want? You know, half the places I do business, I would never go there. I don't want to live there. 
And I've heard people say, oh, that market, you know, such and such market, I, I don't want to go there. Who cares if you want to go there? Is there demand? Anyway, so I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but you're not the center of the world. Stop assuming you are. Uh, so to your point, I'll tell you another quick anecdote that answers the question very simply. I was talking to my dad the other day and he and my mom have retired and they were getting rid of both their cars and they were consolidating to just a truck. And my dad's Subaru was only a couple years old. It was pretty nice. It was one of the nicer ones. And he told me he traded it in to the dealer. And I said, Dad, why, why didn't you sell that yourself? You know, you have the time. You could have sold it substantially higher. They're just going to turn around and flip it. And he just goes, you know, I've pinched and, and saved my whole life. I just didn't want to deal with it because I don't have to. And that's who sells it at a discount. That's it. They just, they just want to be done. Just yep. want to be done. And what is your unique selling proposition or what is it that you offer as a benefit to the sellers to do business with you and to sell to you? Two things. So number one, I really, really intentionally teach my acquisition managers about new construction, going back to how and, and, and when I learned, I learned by actually building single family houses with, with, with my older friend and, and, and mentor. And, and so many of the people that have moved into land and direct to seller marketing, they don't know anything about new construction. They don't know what a plat map is or what setbacks are or yeah, plot plan, perk test, all these different uh, terms that are all essential to being able to put new construction on a lot. And so that helps a lot because many of these sellers are retired developers that just have a couple lots left. And so actually being able to competently speak on the asset class we're targeting is really essential. And then kind of as a corollary to that, again, so many people have tried to come from single family house, wholesaling or flipping into land. And they assume that the avatar is the same. It's not. It's oftentimes apathy more than it is distress. In fact, I in several hundred deals, maybe three to 5% of the time is any form of distress. And most of the time these people have money they have time. They just don't want to deal with it. And so understanding that and marketing accordingly is really important. Don't put fast cash clothes on your postcards or, or letters to uh, land sellers. It's it's land. What else are you going to close with? Uh, and and to that point, focusing on legitimacy and the ability to close has been really powerful because so many of, again, these people who come from the wholesaling world, they don't have money. And so they're trying to assign lots. And many of these sellers have had their time wasted with somebody who put them under contract and then couldn't close. And so we emphasize proof of funds. Uh, we'll, in a lot of cases, if it's a market we really know, we'll put up non-refundable earnest money day one. Here's our title agent. We've done dozens of transaction with or attorney. If it's the Carolinas or an attorney state, uh, you can talk to our attorney or, or title agent. Uh, and all of this builds legitimacy in the seller's mind, which is the most important pain point. It's not speed. It's not quick cash close. It's legitimacy. Is this a scam? Can this person really close? And so uh, aligning all of our marketing, all of our talk tracks and scripts around that uh, helps us get deals where other people do not. Uh, how are you funding uh, these infield lots? Private money or, or uh, other ways? It's a mix. I have a good amount of my own money in it. I have a bunch of lines of credit and then I use private money as well. Awesome. Very good. Well, I got a question for you. Um, and that is, um, if somebody is interested and I know they are to learn more about how you do what you do, how can they connect with you? Dan .com or Dan Habercost on Instagram or Facebook. Easiest way. That's you can, pretty easy. <laughs> yeah. Shoot me a message. Uh, do we have a, a few more minutes? Uh, Cause I have a whole nother uh, in, uh, endeavor on the topic of private money. I wanted to talk about. Please do go for it. Okay. So I mentioned that land is inefficient. And part of that is if you want to go buy a single family house or the strip center down the street or a storage facility, there are endless lenders for that product, right? For land, if you need money, <laughs> there there are no institutions or, or companies really, there are very, very few that will lend on land. I know there's some companies that'll do for a mom and pop that wants to build a house and live at it, a land at home package, but it's it's based around doing new construction soon. And really it's it doesn't work for what I'm talking about. And so everyone I know in the land space that's just buying and selling or buying and improving via entitlements or subdivide and reselling, 
uh, has trouble raising money. So whenever you identify a problem that any everyone in the industry has, that presents an opportunity. So a, a friend of mine who has the same business as me, he and I recently launched, launched Ground Up Partners where we are providing capital for land deals. We'll partner with the person that brings the land deal, help double check the due diligence and then do a profit split on the back end. But to the whole point of this show, Jay, we just signed uh, actually with an attorney and are putting together a, uh, a fund and working on raising quite a bit of money. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll pause there because I'm realizing as we speak, uh, I'm not sure how much I can and can't say, but uh, working on doing this at scale in a more efficient and simple manner uh, to to grow that business because it's a huge opportunity because almost nobody's providing capital for land yet we're in a building boom because there's a housing shortage and to construct new housing you need land well that's fantastic well you're exactly right i mean you've identified an area where people need funding for land deals mm -hmm. and so now you're putting together a platform to where they can and so you're raising money for that fund as well right mm-hmm and yep. so if if, uh, if someone is listening here and interested in getting some returns on their funds, they could reach out to you and talk about that fund and how they could participate, right? Yes, absolutely. That's fantastic. Dan, thank you so much for joining me again here on Raising Private Money. It's so good to see you again. And thank you for bringing value to the audience. Thanks, Jay. It was fun. Absolutely. Well, there you have it. Another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, and we really appreciate if you happen to be listening on iTunes or Spotify or any of the podcast platforms, be sure and follow me so you don't miss out on any of the other upcoming episodes. If you happen to be watching on YouTube, be sure to like, subscribe, and ring that bell so you get notice of the very next episode. I'm looking forward to being a part of taking your business to the next level. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority. Looking forward to seeing you right here on the next episode of Raising Private Money. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jayconner.com slash money guide. That's jconner.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconner.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Connor.